They say the best things in life come in threes, right? Well, sometimes, and just sometimes, that includes books. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with another I guess top 10 list? Is that what we're going to call these now? Yes, I don't do top 10 lists very often, but if it's something that is uh, requested quite a bit by my audience, I'll go ahead and break down and do those. And today's topic is something that I kind of came up, I was reading a trilogy that I was working on, and I said I had a good chance of landing in my top trilogies of all time. I said, I don't know if that's a video you guys would be interested in. And the feedback I got was, yes, that was something that you guys were very, very interested in. So today, guys, we're here to talk about my favorite trilogies of all time. Now, I want to say up front, guys, that this is the rules on this are going to upset some people, and some people are going to say that's going to, that makes sense. Uh, with me, there are many of these. They are trilogies, either when they originally came out or maybe a little bit later. But it's something that I think is they, they count. They count because it's part of a series, maybe a bigger series. But they were originally a trilogy, or they stand alone as a trilogy. I'm going to count them. So I know it's, a, like I said, it's going to be kind of a, a thin ice with some people. But hey, uh, make, show me your list. That's what I say. Show me your list instead of telling me why mine suck. That's what I always hope comes out of these top 10 lists. Also, I got to say, if there's a series that you love and I don't include it here, uh, there could be multiple reasons for that. One might be, hey, sometimes I really enjoy a trilogy, but one of the books I might not have liked that much. Also, there's a good chance, and this is probably more likely, I just haven't read it yet. So I want to make sure that you guys understand where I'm coming from on this. I want to begin with a couple of honorable mentions before I get into the top 10. First is going to be Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn by Tad Williams. I read this uh, late or early last year, like at the beginning of the year. Had a great time with this world. Now, one thing I will say about this list, guys, is legacy takes time. So some of these series that I've read rather recently, uh, they might not pop up very, very high because I say, like I said, legacy does take some time with me. Some things need to bake a little bit before I can kind of really move them up. And I think Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, not quite there on my trilogies yet, although I did have it in my top 10 fantasy series of all time. So they're, they're kind of kind of uh, giving my hand away a little bit. This isn't going to be just fantasy series, guys. But uh, yeah, I, I, I did love the world that Tad Williams created. A beautiful, beautiful writer. I could see how he was very much the inspiration for multiple other series. Like I look at Realm of the Elderlings, and I'm like, Robin Hobb had to be greatly influenced by this series because I saw a lot of Assassin's Apprentice in those early books of Memory, Sorrow, and Thor. So that's when I think uh, over time, it'll probably creep onto a list like this. Uh, even though, you know, that third book was basically two books, uh, it's still, it was released as a trilogy, so I'm going to count it as a trilogy. Next is The Last War by Mike Shackle. Now, I just finished this one. Like I said, Legacy Takes Time, so it's going to take a little while. What I love about The Last War is the idea of the book begins with our heroes, as they were, losing. They lose, and they are inside of this occupied city by the enemy. And I think that that's just such a fascinating idea. I've never really seen that before, so... It begins a story with our heroes losing and trying to find a way to overcome that and hopefully eventually take their land back from their oppressor. So I love that. I thought he's a really, really good character writer. Had a really nice little plot device in there that I thought was a nice twist to the story. It really made it special and unique. And it's a very, very, very brutal grimdark series. And uh, it, 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 that's kind of a hard test to pass with me because a lot of people tell me, hey, read this. It's so grimdark. And I'll get it. I'll be like, no, that's just nihilism or that's just rated R. You know, so for me, it's just you go into that fine question, that fine line of what is grimdark. And that's something I don't know that we'll ever really understand. But that one kind of was uh, kind of something that scratched that Joe Abercrombie itch since I've been getting new Joe Abercrombie books the last couple of years. And that, that kind of did help me there. So let's get into the list proper here. Number 10, you guys might have heard of it. It is kind of a YouTube darling. I read it for the first time last year. This is The Green Bone Saga by Fonda Lee. This was released between 2017 and 2021. What I liked about this, guys, is a big, big time Godfather fan. So I love the idea of fantasy meets the mafia, basically. That was a really cool idea. And I think it was one of those things, like even if it wasn't a fantasy book, you know, because most people think fantasy, they think swords and shields, you know, 14th century medieval Europe. They think of things like that. But this, it isn't fantasy in that way. It has a magic system. It has, you know, 
certain things I think go along with fantasy. It does. It is kind of fall under the fantasy umbrella. But for me, it was like you could have took that element out of it, and I still think it would have been a very, very good mafia or crime family kind of story. But a great, great relationship writer. I think finally really does write those relationships so much that you really are all there with that family, where you really are just rooting for them, and you get to go through the years with that. Something that I, I love is a series that takes us through the daily life and through the year, many, many years of a character and or a family and she does it great had a great great ending and it was a very very satisfying series uh, to the point where, like like would I like to visit that world again yes do I think she needs to no I think this story was very well told the way that it was and I'm happy where she did end it number nine guys are gonna kind of lean away from the fantasy here kind of inch a little bit into the science fiction somewhat this is the Wayward Pines trilogy by Blake Crouch this was released between 2012 2014. You guys know by now I have become a big time Crouch Potato. I've really enjoyed almost everything I've read by Blake Crouch. Has been great. I feel like he has filled that Michael Crichton sized hole in my heart. He really has kind of just just hit all those notes that I loved about Mr. Crichton's writing. What I loved about this is it kind of felt like, I don't know, Twin Peaks meets the X-Files. I kind of got that vibe out of it because it is very much a big mystery where you're like, what is going on here? You're paranoid about everything. Everyone seems like it could be part of a big giant conspiracy or cover-up. And when you find out what that thing is, you're like, oh, wow, it's going there. So it was very, very cool story. I love that he never really jumped the shark. with. There were some things where he took some chances, and they landed really, really well. And that third book, it really took some jumps. And it was like, they're actually quite well done. So props to Blake Crouch for pulling off what he did. And that's another one that's like, I look at most of these trilogies, I'm like, would I like more? You know, in some instances, we did get more. And I'll get into those in a minute. But with some of them, like uh, Greenbone Saga, like Wayward Pines now, where I'm like, I like where it ended. And I'm fine uh, never visiting that world again because I felt like it was a full and complete and very satisfying story. Number eight, this one's a classic, guys. I love me some traditional fantasy. This is the Icewind Dale trilogy by R.A. Salvatore, released between 1988 through 1990. I am very, very late to the world of Forgotten Realms, guys. I never read these books for the longest time because I was like, oh, I haven't really played Dungeons and Dragons very much. So I don't feel like I should, I would understand that. And people are like, it's just set in that world, man. It's just a fantasy book. You don't have to know anything about like a crit, a uh, crit 20, hit 20, any of that, any stuff, any of those Dungeons and Dragons. So it tells you how little I played right there. I don't even know what I'm saying. Crit 20. If I think about that, as I talked to R.A. Salvatore recently and he told a Dungeons and Dragons story and I completely missed the punchline because I'm Pretty much like a noob when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, guys. It happens sometimes, but R.A. Salvatore, awesome. Awesome guy. Check out that interview. Uh, so Icewind Dale, what I really, really loved about this series was just it felt like a hat tip to Tolkien. It really did. It felt like a love letter. Never in like a ripping off kind of way. Because, I've, guys, I've read plenty that's like, wow, you really liked Fellowship of the Ring. You liked it so much, you rewrote it and just changed the character names. With this, I never really felt that. What I felt with this, like, there was very many things that I felt reminiscent. and been like, okay, this kind of makes me think of that moment in The Hobbit, in The Lord of the Rings. Makes me think about the Fellowship, things like that. But I love the idea of an animal companion that Drist has in the story. Now, I love a dual-wielding character. I think that's really, really cool. I love Dark Elves. I love animal companions, and these are two of the best, okay? Drist, dual-wielding Dark Elf, total badass, and has a great, great setup in the, uh, the the Dark Elf trilogy, which I did read in that order, by the way. It was released later. But what I liked about Icewind Dale more was it was Driss with this traveling group, including his animal companion, Guinevar, which is, again, if I was redoing, guys, my favorite animal companions list, Guinevar would be on that list for sure. I think that's one of the coolest animal companions ever. What an incredible idea that one was. But I love him just with like his friends and family. And this is a guy who's been rejected and just looking for someone to accept him for so many years and he finally does have like this core group of friends who love him for who he is not what he is and that's just a great great message and that, that what this series did that the previous one didn't is i felt like it really gave dritz that that, that adversary that he needed in artemis and trari there's a cool cool villain and it's just a perfect contrast you know you got dress 
is you know the the the, the drow with the human morals, and we got Entrari, which is the the human with the drow morals. Such a great great contrast between those two characters, and I just love their competition in this whole trilogy. Really, really great great stuff. So don't let the idea of you haven't played very much Dungeons and Dragons or you don't like a lot of traditional fantasy, don't let that hold you back, guys. Drift books are a ton of fun. They're low commitment, and they are a wild wild ride. And again. Animal Companions. They're the best. Number seven, guys. I read this one, uh, was it last year or the year before? I can't remember. This is The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. This is the first Bernard Cornwell that I've read. These were released between 1995 and 1997. Uh, I really, really liked the first book. Now, the second book, Enemy of God, took this series into another level for me because it took our main character and it sped up the years a little bit where we had a little bit of what I call dad shit in it. And that dad stuff is so so good but there are so many things about the arthurian legend that that mr cornwell plays with here that really make it just fun because i'm a big thomas mallory uh you know lamar arthur kind of guy i love that legend so i've been all over it for years and the fact that he plays with some of those things and tries to make it like as close to historical fiction as possible really really neat idea he really kind of subverts some expectations with the character of lance a lot that's something that's really really great merlin is an all-time character in this guys he is so so good in this whole series i love it so i love all of the things that he played with in stories kind of treat it like hey the legend that we've come to know is because it really happened like this but the person that he's retelling the story to doesn't like some things as you can tell she became the unreliable narrator to what the legend of arthur that we know now really really neat idea and just a banger of a series guys it's just so damn good i don't know anyone who would not like this and with me it feels like bernard cornwell set the bar so high for historical fiction everything i've read since then historical fiction i've been like eh, it's okay so uh, i feel like maybe maybe i shouldn't have started my historical fiction journey with Mr. Cornwell because he's just so damn good at it. I hope to get to uh, Saxon stories here eventually. But uh, yeah, Warlord Chronicles, guys. So good. So damn good. You'll love it. Number six, I got to go with the original Mistborn trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. Here's where I start getting to some of that thing where it's not really a trilogy anymore because if you really think about it, there's been seven Mistborn books and some novellas and it's going to keep going. But I thought, hey, Spoiler, I'm going to have a Robin Hobb series on here later. I'm like, okay, well, if I'm counting these individual trilogies within the realm of the Elderlings, which is one long series, I can count this one. You know, why not? But with the original Mistborn trilogy, like this was my introduction to Brandon Sanderson. I read this before Elantris, before Stormlight Archive. Hell, before Wheel of Time. I felt like this guy just completely grabbed my attention, had a large cast of, you know, just rogue characters. I really, really liked that, you know, these guys were just all... Uh, just outcasts and they all come together. They kind of make their own little family. And I love that. I love a good high story. I love a dark Lord. I love a redemption arc. This story has all of those, those things. And I just, I love this crew so damn much. I actually even like the romance subplot. Now there's some things that some people didn't like. I like that a lot. I like how every time you think you know where the story is going, Brandon Sanderson would always jab you with that left. Like you, I, mean, I feel like he's mastered this, this way of subverting your expectations, but never insulting you. Never. So every time you think you know which way it's going, boom, he hits you with that surprise left and it lands so good. So this book has, so, I mean, this whole series has so much good political intrigue in it, has really good lore, good world building. And I just, I, I love everything about this before I even knew that this Cosmere thing was all, all connected. So uh, it's a really great introductory, uh, introductory series for Brandon Sanderson. If you haven't read Brandon Sanderson yet, I think it's a really great, great place to start. And that's a question I get quite a bit. But yeah, Mistborn, uh, it's one of those that I, I wonder in hindsight how much is nostalgia here because I know some people that have found the channel, you know, in the past year or so have been like, ah, I just, I don't know what you love so much about Mistborn. And with me guys, it's like not everything has, I love Grimdark. I love it. I love adult fantasy. I, I, I don't have any problems with maybe something that's aimed for a little bit of younger audiences because I grew up on traditional fantasy, guys. I still love it. I still love C.S. Lewis and things like that, guys. I, I, I love those things. Not everything has to be blood and guts and super serious and ultra realistic. You know, I mean, I read fantasy for escapism and Brandon Sanderson has definitely given me that. Number five, guys, I kind of tipped my hand. This is the Live Ship Trader Trilogy by Ms. Robin Hobb, the first lady of of epic fantasy. These were released between 1998 and the year 2000. I very famously was like, I really liked two thirds of Assassin's Apprentice. And I liked about two-ish or one and a half-ish. I liked about half of Tawny Man. Whereas Live Ship Traders, 
I like the whole thing. I think the whole thing was just slamming. I loved it to death. I thought it kicked so much ass because it had such amazing character relationships. I am a big time character, or character first kind of reader. If you have the most amazing world and you have a beautiful prose, but I don't care about your characters, eh, I'm not invested. If you have great characters, I'll find out a way to get interested in your world. And I think what Hob does here is the best like family relationship stuff I've ever seen since Stephen King. With me, I love the way that Stephen King writes family, writes characters, writes damaged characters, writes uncomfortable relationships, writes about how family really truly is. And it's not always pretty. And Miss Hobb finds a way to do those same things here. Not all things are happy with this family. But you know what? When all the chips are down, they pull together and they make things work. And that's something that's uh, really inspirational. It's really, really great stuff. I loved everything about Live Ship Traders. I didn't want it to end. All of the stuff in that series really that, that kind of connected it with the rest of the world made that world feel bigger, obviously. But this trilogy really could stand on its own. And again, guys, maybe the second most layered villain I've ever read in fantasy in Captain Kennedy. Such an amazing, amazing character. The other one is going to come up on this list as well, I think. Although it's kind of debated if he's a villain or not. I don't know. Because we'll talk about that when we get there. But with the with Life of Traders, guys, just maybe one of the best character series I've ever read. And it made me see why everyone loves Robin Hobb so much. And Life of Traders, I could read it again tomorrow and enjoy it. I loved it so much. And uh, I couldn't get enough of it. And it's amazing she was able to do that, guys, because I'm not very famous for not liking nautical books. And she found a way to make those really, really amazing. How about number four, guys? Got to go to that galaxy far, far away. This is the Thrawn Trilogy by Timothy Zahm. This came out between 91 and 93, guys. This was an event when it happened. I remember going. it was on the news. This was going to be... His, historical. This was going to be canon. This was going to be something that actually happens. George Lucas was putting his stamp on it. This actually happens. You know, they've since kind of erased that. But for people like me who consider the Disney stuff to be fan fiction, this will always be the canon. This started, guys. This is what happened after Return of the Jedi. It was so, so good. When I got went to go get Air of the Empire the day that it came out, it was at a Walden Books. Any of you guys here old enough to remember Walden books. And I went to the store and seriously, it was like a party. They were playing Star Wars music over the speakers. There were people there in like the authentic costumes from the movie of Boba Fett, a stormtrooper and Darth Vader. I mean, it, was, it looked just like the movie. It was so cool. It was just an event. It was huge. And we just knew this was going to be something special. And it was, guys. The Thrawn trilogy. How do you follow Darth Vader? Uh, Timothy Zahn found a way because Admiral Thrawn, so different than Darth Vader but such a memorable villain. So good. There's a reason why they keep trying to pull him over into the Disney canon now because he's just such an incredible character. And you know what? Timothy Zahn could have done the easy way and just made a Darth Vader clone, and he didn't do that. He said, I'm going to have a different kind of nuanced villain who uses his mind. He's basically the Batman of villains. He's always three steps ahead of everyone else. And he's just such a great villain. He makes that just such a spectacular series and seeing that like, holy shit, you know, the Empire was in tatters after the Emperor and Darth Vader died. But you know what? They could actually win this. You know, the New Rebellion was fledgling at the time. And it, the, it, uh, the New Republic. It was just, it was, it's so good, guys. It really, really is. It's amazing. All you have to have seen is the original trilogy of movies to really enjoy that series. It's, it's spectacular. You get to see even more stuff with Luke learning the, how to control his powers and things like that. You get to see the relationship between Han and Leia, guys. It's, it's amazing. You get to see the Wookiee homeworld for the first time of Kashyyyk. It had everything that a someone at my age it was like missing. I was missing Star Wars. It had been you know eight years since Return of the Jedi. That was just something that I watched occasionally when I had time, and it brought Star Wars full time back into my life. Where it was like that was all I could think about. And of all of these books in here that I've read, all this stuff behind me, I have not spent more time in any single universe than I have that galaxy far, far away. That's why that series will always be just amazing to me. So the fact that I've got three left, uh, it's kind of amazing as you can hear how much I love Thrawn trilogy. Number three is going to be The Red Rising, the original trilogy by Pierce Brown. Now again, I know that there are, book number six is about to come out. For me, it's the original trilogy and then it's the, it was the sequel trilogy before the last book got uh, split in half. So I, I look at it like the original trilogy and the sequel series is how I kind of look at it. So it is the same universe. It is the same characters. It is 10 years later. But with me, this original trilogy is an open and closed story. If you want to stop here, you can. I hope you don't. 
but I think you can. And that's why I'm going to count it here. What this did for me, guys, is it took... How do I take something I love, like Frank Herbert's Dune, and something else I love, like the Star Wars EU, and mash them into one universe? That's Red Rising, guys. You love those ideas and those themes and those hard-to-ask questions that Frank Herbert put out in Dune. And then you take just the fun, awesome, adventure, space opera, sci-fi, like Star Wars, and you mash them together, guys. That is Red Rising. With a little bit of uh, Roman history sprinkled in. You know, Sometimes it feels like you're really reading like some history books or stuff because of some of the things that the characters reference and the way that they talk and the way that the structure of the society is, is, is built is really based off the back of those Roman themes and maybe some Greek ideals. It's really, really amazing stuff. It's fascinating that way. Has one of the coolest sci-fi weapons ever in the Razor. I, I just, it's just such an amazingly fun series. It gets, all the time it gets kind of mislabeled as YA because the protagonists are like 20 when the series starts. And guys, I'm just telling you, that's a big time misnomer because this is one of the most adult series that I've read. Uh, book number five, Dark Age, is one of the darkest books I've ever read in my life. So this is a series that kind of keeps growing with the reader as it goes along. But this first trilogy, like I said, it's nothing that I consider sunshine and rainbows. It's a very, very dark series, but it's a hell of a fun adventure with great, great character development and amazing action. I mean, it's just it's amazing that Pierce Brown is able to take these books and just make them non-stop action, but you never feel like it's sacrificing character development. He's a master at this. And you know what? He's quite cruel. He's quite cruel because he makes you care about those characters before those bad things happen. If you've been a viewer of this channel at all, guys, you know how I feel about Red Rising at this point. I mean, you have to know. It's one of my favorite series ongoing. So how can I have two things above it? Well, because number two is going to be The First Law Trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. This came out between 2006 and 2008. The first thing I did on this channel that was not Wheel of Time based was the first law because this was a series where I was like, I have been trying to sell this series to people for so many years. I was telling everyone I knew who were upset that George wasn't putting out new Song of Ice and Fire books, I got something I think will scratch that itch. Now, that's not to say that the first law is like the Song of Ice and Fire. What that is saying is, I think it'll give you some of those things that you like about it. And this is Grimdark Defined, this series right here. Besides the Song of Ice and Fire, what makes First Law so special is besides that series, this is the most I have ever connected with the cast of characters like this. I have never, ever been able to identify a character like that. I can read mid-sentence and know which character it is because you feel like you know his characters because you've got multi-POV, you're inside their head all the time, and they do so much inner monologuing that you feel like you know them inside and out because you're listening to their thoughts the whole time. It's so bloody good, guys. It's actually quite fantastic that he is able to make it humorous when absolutely terrible stuff is going on. And where I said it's kind of controversial that I say that Sandan Galacta is a villain because what he does in this series is this was kind of new to me. I, I had seen it in Song of Ice and Fire, but he goes even more with this one that like, these are all detestable human beings. They are doing awful, awful stuff why am I cheering for them? But damn it, I am. I want them to win. You know, he was able to do that. And what he did with Sandan Galacta, probably the most layered villain, I guess you would call him, even though, like I said, you're rooting for him. But he does such, such awful things. The guy's an inquisitor, for God's sakes. It's, it's, it's amazing what he's able to do with this character to have you rooting for him and others. I mean, there's everyone in this series has bad, bad stuff. There's people who've died of a bad past. They're trying to be better people, but they keep, you know, keep getting pulled back the wrong way. There are people who start bad, become likable. There are people who start maybe likable, become bad. He's able to make you root for these characters that you would not, any other series, they would be the bad guys. They would be the rogues that you want the good guy to get away from. He's able to make you care about this. So whenever you hear about morally gray and things like that, I know it's a buzz phrase now in fantasy, but this was the first I'd ever read it in. And he just does it just perfect. And this original trilogy, such a good story. And what a shocker of an ending. And it's an ending that doesn't land with everyone, but it's one of those that you think about after a while because I'm included. First time I read it, I was mad. I was mad for like a year. And after about a year went by, I was like, you know, it's actually brilliant. It's actually quite brilliant the way that he ended that trilogy. So... Hope you guys will check it out if you have not. Besides Red Rising, I can't think of another series I push harder on this channel 
than the first law. And number one, guys, I don't think it's going to be a shock to anybody. And I want you to understand before I say this, that this is not a series that is skating by on Legacy alone. It's not. This is an absolutely amazing, amazing series. I'm talking about the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Mr. J. R. R. Tolkien. You might have heard of him, 1954 through 1955, but he actually was writing this for about 17 years. Uh, a lot of people want to assume that, oh, you just put that there because you feel like you have to. No, guys, I have reread the Lord of the Rings trilogy seven times, and somehow it just keeps getting better. It just absolutely hits every single time. I love this journey with this cast. I love what they go. They go through hell and back together. And you are there with them. You are crawling up the side of that mountain with Sam and Frodo. You know, you are fighting, you are fighting your way to the Black Gate with Aragorn and Gandalf. You are there with these characters the whole time. And that's what makes it so special is the journey. And guys, this might be the greatest story ever told. This has one of the deepest myths and legend and lore in any series I've ever read. I think only Song of Ice and Fire comes close for me in building up the histories of this world. The guy was a wizard. He really, really was. A lot of people like to say, oh, such and such was before their time. Well, Mr. Tolkien was definitely not only ahead of his time, but he was special. He was special. The fact that this guy created so many things. Look, he didn't create the fantasy genre like a lot of people like to try to pretend, but he popularized it. He made it a mainstay in our culture, I believe. And uh, so many things today always, well, let me go back to the foundation. How would Tolkien have done it? That's what I'm going to do. You still see that today. I guarantee you guys, every modern fantasy author that you like today, at one point or another, read this series and thought it was their jam. It really was. It was. So this deserves this spot. Again, I'll never, ever do that thing where something skates by off legacy alone. No, things can change. I Look, I love nostalgia as much as anybody else, but I can, I can take it off and be like, you know what? I've got the nostalgia glasses on. I understand that I'm only doing that for nostalgia's sake. Not the case with this one. I reread this series again, like I said, for the seventh time in 2019, and I loved it still. And I would read it again tomorrow. So, guys, that is my 10 favorite trilogies of all time. All of us are subject to change, just like my top 10 fantasy series list. I, I think with this is, uh, again, legacy takes time. It's going to take a while for some of these newer ones that I've read to kind of crack any higher than they are but i'm sure some new ones will come in some old ones will shuffle out that's how top 10 lists work but uh, i would recommend all 10 of these all 12 of these that i listed here for anyone and everyone to read i think there's a little bit of something for everyone here so guys i am interested in hearing about some of your favorite trilogies i love recommendations if there's something you felt like i haven't brought up here go ahead and let me know down below have you read any of these what did you think? What would be your list? As always, like I said, I'd love to hear your list, not why mine is terrible. So drop in the comments, guys, and I will talk to you there.